Hey everybody, welcome to the Orange Crush Podcast with David Hood and Grayson Mann of TigerNet. It's Wake Forest Week, and I'm I'm really excited about this guest. We have Dave Gorn. Now, Dave Gorn wears many hats. How he is going to be, you know, of interest to Clemson fans with Wake Forest coming up is you will see him with his little old man hat or, or something or old man jacket down on the sidelines as the sideline reporter uh, for the Wake Forest Radio Network. But Dave, that is one of many hats that you wear, including college professor, uh, executive director of the uh, National Sports Media Association, Atlantic Coast Conference Sports Media. What are what are all these hats that you wear right now? I don't know. I think I've worn too many because I'm I'm very thin on top now. So I, I should have had my head get a little more sunshine. But yeah, I'm gonna uh, have to start wearing hats. It, it it's fun. It keeps me busy. It keeps me young. And you know, when you're on around sports all day, what could be better? And what do you teach at Wake Forest? I teach a sports casting class. My background is 24 years in TV sports. My last 20 here in Winston Salem at WXI TV. And so, you know, I, it was very scary. We were at the ACC uh, basketball media kickoff or tip off in Charlotte the other day. And a couple of us were comparing when we started our media careers. And I actually started as a 15 year old high school junior covering high school sports for my local newspaper in Massachusetts. And that was 1975. So by my count, I have entered my 50th year of sports media. How did that happen? Well done. Well done. I had uh, a, a youngster in the press box at the beginning of the year ask me, uh, what, what year did you cover your first Clemson game? And I, I looked at them and I said, I have to be really honest with you. My first Clemson game was September the 18th, 1986, Clemson in Georgia. And I was out of high school in college working as an intern at the Greenville News. And Dan Foster, the legendary sports editor of the Greenville News, walked in that morning, handed me a press pass and said, you're going to be a photo runner today. So that was my first press pass. <laughs> so you, you beat me by two years covering Clemson. I believe my first Clemson game was at NC State. So the, uh, the textile bowl. And my memory of that game is after leaving, I happened to, with 50,000 people there, I run into a guy I went to college with. I went to Syracuse, which wasn't playing that day, but he was there watching and I was there covering the game and there he was. That's what I remember. I think it was, it was I remember it being a low scoring game, like a lot of field goals, like 9-6 or 12-9. Might have to go, I have to go look that up. <laughs> Some history lessons here on the Orange Crush podcast. Dave, what's sort of the day-to-day, or I guess the day in the life of when you get to the Wake Forest sideline aspect of the hats that you wear, sort of what is that process like on a on a normal Saturday? Well, I, I, I would actually back up and and tell you we, we attend Dave Clawson's formal press conference on Tuesday afternoon. And one of the cool things we do is after he's done with the formal press conference, uh, in the team auditorium, we go downstairs into the one of the, the new buildings uh, for football, and we have a little off-the-record session, and it's been incredibly uh, educational for those of us. And, you know, I've covered sports, as I said, for almost 50 years uh, and covered a lot of football and a lot of football games, but to have the kind of insight that he's willing to give is amazing. And, uh, and then Saturday, typically try to get there three hours before kickoff. Uh, we go on the air one hour before Stan Cotton, our play-by-play guy and Larry Sorensen, our, our color man, our engineer, Tim Sparks, our spotter, Josh Nixon. Um, you know, when the, the pregame show comes on, Stan will you know, open the show toss to Larry for a quick comment, and then he'll toss to me down on the field for an opening comment. And then until two years ago, I was done with the pregame, pregame show, but two years ago they decided they wanted me to interview somebody on the field. And that's been fun because it can be anybody. And, you know, I, I try to think like a fan. It's like I would like to – I always like to get the behind-the-scenes, behind-the-curtain look. It's like, what do, what do you do? I know, I know you have a title, but what do you do? And the guy that I'm still trying to get to do it with me is the guy who drives the semi. 
with all the equipment from place to place. So far, he, I, I think he's really, really shy. He doesn't he want to come on with me. But I've done, you know, team doctors, uh, booster club people, a team nutritionists, um, tutors, every, anyone who has anything to do with either the team or the athletic program as a whole. It's been, it's been really interesting. So now that, that makes, I have a question. I've always wanted to ask somebody and I keep forgetting. Is the mascot that drives the motorcycle out the same guy that is the mascot during the game? Or do they have some special guy that hangs out in the Harley bar on Friday nights as the mascot for that moment? <laughs> That's a really good question. I am not sure I know the answer, but I, I'm actually, I, I, I am pretty sure I know the answer. Different. I think they're brothers. They're twins. Ah, gotcha. How about that? Well, at least on, on the outside, on the inside, it'd be t- the person who performs during the game is a student. I do not yeah. believe the person who rides the Harley out is a student. Got gotcha. a liability there if there's a student driving that Harley. Liability, liability. Or the state. <laughs> That's true. Right. Or the, the wagon in Oklahoma. I've seen that <laughs> topple a couple times. So who knows? Yeah, the, the one, the one I, I fear we will see one day is somebody get trampled by Ralphie the Buffalo at Colorado. <laughs> or Bevo at Texas. That's right. <laughs> well, they almost had a, I think, Ugga and the and the Debo from Texas almost brawl a little bit at the Sugar yeah, Bowl absolutely. in 2018. So there's there's danger here, guys. There's danger. Yeah, and, I, and I'm a big fan of bulldogs as a species. So I would be all, all over Ugga. So anyway, so that's my pregame routine, and then we go into the game, and it's uh, – if I have something to say, my microphone is open only to our engineer. So I, I don't know how we came up with this as a as my go-to, but I say, I'll take. Like, that sounds really selfish. Uh, and then he will tell Stan Cotton in his ear that I have something, and, and Stan, Stan will throw Cotton it down to me. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and the Cotton absolute – I mean, we're, we're very fortunate – fortunate in this league the announcers who work this league are some of the nicest people i have ever met and that includes don munson at clemson who i go way back with um but anyway then you know depending on whether tv wants coach clausen first coming off the field if they do i will get him coming out from the locker room at halftime Uh, otherwise i will get him going in and then after the game i interview two players outside the locker room and then i'm done for the day but it's typically a you know, seven-hour day for home games, and um, you know it'll be forty-eight hours plus when we go out to Stanford in two weeks. So, well, yeah, it's going to be a travel and it's going to be a trip. Yeah. I guess, Dave, when we dive into the X's and O's of this Clemson Wake Forest matchup, I guess I want to start with what you've seen from this Demon Deacon squad. Obviously, just picked up a big win over at NC State this past weekend. Uh, how is this offense sorting to find its groove? Uh, and just what are some things that maybe Clemson fans need to watch for going into this noon kick? Well, well I think Hank Bachmeyer, the transfer portal quarterback they got, spent three years at Boise State. Last year at Louisiana Tech had some injuries. Last year he has been really good. And, and you guys know, anytime you put a new guy in there, whether it's a freshman or a transfer, it takes a little while to get used to a new offense and then used to the personnel who – with whom you haven't played yet, but he's come in and done a really nice job. Offensive line is improved from last year. Um, we had some, we've had some injuries at receiver and, and still some of the younger guys have stepped in and filled those roles nicely. You can almost see that improvement on a week to week basis. And Damon Claiborne at running back um, is as good as wake has had, you know, maybe Kenneth Walker, the third who's playing in the NFL. Um, other than that, maybe the best running back in the last 20 to 25 years. So offensively, they're playing really well. They had a couple of missteps against Ole Miss that probably would have made that game closer. And, and then, you know, the defense and Coach Clausen will tell you the de- defensive secondary is where they're struggling and then not getting enough of a pass rush, rush to take some of the heat off the secondary it is a secondary issue. Um, I think the players would tell you they should be four and one right now. You know, those two one score losses, including the, the, the last minute field goal attempt that clanged off the upright that would have tied mm-hmm. it, sent it to overtime and then a one score loss less than a touchdown to Virginia. So 
you know, we all know it's a funny game and you have to, you, know, you, you can say could have, would have, should have, but unless you did, you are what you, what the record says you are. So here we go. We're, we're so used to this Wake Forest offense and seeing Sam Hartman run it to perfection with that slow mesh. And I've tried to go back and watch a couple. Are they doing that slow mesh with Bach Myers as much as they once did? Um, I don't you know, maybe the last couple of years, I, I think people thought that was all they have run. And the last couple of years, uh, they've I gone away from it. Yeah. Dave Clawson said they've been running it maybe 20% of the time. So, right. you know, I, I haven't studied it enough to know what percentage of the time they're running it. They are still running it. Um, Hank doesn't look as comfortable with it as Sam did, but, you know, Sam had it down to, had it down to a T. So, and, and you can't argue with the offensive uh, production from, from Hank. So, you know, he's getting better at running it week by week. And, uh, and, and still uh, you, you wonder, and you always ask the question, is it still working the way it's supposed to, the way it was designed to sure. with the results that you want to get? And I probably haven't asked that question yet. And you know, might this week. One of the questions, and I'm sorry, Grayson, that, that, uh, that I had the other one was, uh, not they're not throwing to the tight end quite as much either. Harry Lodge has seven receptions, uh, but but that's it. They're kind of letting everything like Bachmeyer really throw it down the field. I don't see a lot of you know that underneath stuff like I'm, I'm used to seeing either. And one of actually one of the things they've done is is thrown to the running back. So uh, last week, in fact, among Claiborne's first touchdown was a, a pass reception that he ran in. So that's something. You know, we all sit there as as amateur offensive coordinators and, and we think we can make the play calls. You know, what we don't see is, you know, what, what are the defensive tendencies that we have watched film all week on that we are going to counter? So you, you like to see them mix things up to keep the defense off balance. They want to do that, but they know what they know what's coming better than we do. And with that that mesh offense, I was talking to Wade Woodaz on Wednesday, Clemson linebacker, and he said that when they really hold on to the ball for that long, it sort of teaches you to go against your tendencies and it forces you to be nosy. The way that sort of defenses have, or offenses have attacked this West Goodwin defense has sort of been to attack tendencies and attack the edge and sort of try to break that norm and that rhythm. Could you see them running a little bit more mesh to say, hey, we're going to challenge this Goodwin defense that's had some challenges against this attack from Wake Forest the last couple of years, or do you maybe see them trying to stay on schedule with Bachmeyer and what he's comfortable with? I think it will be a little bit of both. I mean, you obviously when the, when the coaches watch film, it's um, you know, what are they doing defensively? Can we exploit this exploit that? And then the slow mesh quarterback is looking for his, whatever his key is on that play or keys are uh, and, and then has to make that sp- you hope it's a split second decision. Sometimes we look at it it's like, gosh, would he pull that ball out and do, you know, make a decision already? But he's got to wait for his key. That's the thing that most of us who are who are not uh, not with it all the time and don't watch it all the time and aren't uh, up on what it's supposed to do, you know, we say, hurry up, hurry up, and he might be waiting for that one key. And as I said, the offensive line has improved this year, so they're giving him that extra. Tenth of a second on most plays that can mean the difference between a receiver getting open or maybe a you know a, a one inch more gap that a running back can run through. Defensively, uh, I guess Nick Anderson, he's the the safety, right? Mm-hmm. He and Evan Slocum, who are the veterans in the defensive backfield. He he leads the team with sixty tackles, and I, and I don't think that that is is optimal. Uh, now the the linebackers that that Wake has, I was watching them. You've got Dylan Hazen, uh, Branson Combs, Quincy, Quincy Bryant. Yes, yeah, Bryant. Those guys are two, three, and four. Yeah, what Dave Clawson and, and company would like. How are teams having success? Kind of gashing that Wake Forest defense. Uh, I, I think they've done a good job in, in getting through that first line. So the, basically the defensive line and getting to the second level. Um, and as I mentioned before, 
pass rush is critical for this team because you have corners who have not played together on this in this program before. And so they've had issues with communication, with eye discipline uh, that seemed to get better last week. It looked a lot better, although uh, NC State also had a couple of receivers that were uh, were open. But you know, the defensive philosophy is let's keep them in front of us. Don't let them throw the ball over our heads. So what you will see is is a cushion at times. Um, the Louisiana game a couple of weeks ago, their first drive, they had a third and one. They lined up two receivers to the right. Wake had one corner up tight on the line. The other one was basically uncovered. And as, as soon as I saw that, I said, they're going to throw, you know, depending on which way the corner goes, they're going to throw to the one who is uncovered. And that's exactly what happened. And that, you know, they ended up scoring on that first drive. So, but, you know, coaches watch and they know, and they'll make adjustments as necessary. And then, then the, as you well know, the players have to make uh, those adjustments and adapt themselves. And the, and have that good eye discipline and fit the run correctly and you know all those things that seem very easy to us but when you're you know we're looking down from six or seven stories right from the press box or the tv angle mm-hmm. one of the one of the most uh, beneficial things for me as a sideline reporter i am at field level i'm five foot nine and a half i don't see over a whole lot of six four guys you know so i know what it's like as a small corner Sometimes you don't know where the ball is, um, and, th- and that's just a reality. You know, it's a physical reality. You can't make up for that. You have to hope that your discipline and your practice and your reps have led you to the right play or the right angle or the you know the right run fit. I think shifting to the other side of the ball for Clemson, it's been fascinating to act ask our guests weekly about sort of what they're seeing from the progression of this Tiger offense that suddenly feels like it's with the exception of the Georgia game setting the world on fire. I think it's the third highest scoring offense in the FBS since that UGA loss, just from what you've done with maybe what Dave Clawson said in his weekly press conference to what you've seen from Clemson. uh, Just what have you seen from a development standpoint from not only Cade Klubnick, but from what Garrett Riley's scheme has grown into? Well, honestly, I have not watched the Tigers since the opener, so I would be speaking from ignorance. What what Coach Clawson said on Tuesday is the offensive line has played together a lot. They are much improved, and the receivers, after a couple-year lull, are, are back on an upswing to where they, you know, those of us who know Clemson football know where the wide receivers uh, can be and have been, so... Uh, It'll be a challenge for the Wake defense with that that inexperienced uh, secondary, especially the corners. And the was interesting. One, one of the things that he said uh, was in looking at Kay Klubnik, who uh, had had his struggles last year. He really did. He said, I don't know what they did to him in the offseason. I don't know what happened with that guy in the, in the interim, but he's just a different cat, and he is. Um, I turned to, you know, it may have been Grayson in, in in that App State game, and I said, you know, this kid's growing up right before our eyes. We are seeing the progression, and now he looks like a former five-star quarterback. He is bringing the speed to the, to the table. He's using his legs. He's passing. And, you know, for us on this side, that's probably been the biggest thing. Yes, the offensive line is playing well. Yes, those wide receivers are really good, but that Klubnik kid, and he made a couple of plays last week where, where Florida State was doing what I think, uh, you know, Wake's going to do, kind of playing kind of that two deep safety look, not going to let anybody behind us, and he was content to just kind of work the middle of the field, dump it off, run in the running back, and that just shows a, a level of, of maturity, and, and you saw it. Sam Hartman was not the greatest quarterback in the history of the world those first couple of years. It took him time to, to grow into that role. Same thing with John Wolford before him. It's the same thing. You know, one of the things I, I wish, well, I wish for the world, the, the <laughs> word understanding. People don't take enough to, time to understand. I don't care how, how many stars you have. If you have 10 stars when you come in, the college game is different from high school. It is a faster pace. You have to learn at a faster pace. 
You are playing with and against bigger and faster people. So to expect young men to come in and perform at a 10 star level is usually a fool's errand. Um, understand that it takes young men time to develop, time to learn, time to get used to that speed and the size of, of the people he's playing with and against, and, and that it might take time, you know? Yeah, and then something that has really been fascinating to watch is the matchups between Wake and Clemson for the last couple of years. Really been something that maybe – Fans been didn't expect it was really a complete fist fight from last year to a shootout in 2022. Just from the just from the recent matchups, just what has it been about this matchup? I, I know that Dabo Sweeney and Dave Kloss have a really close relationship. It feels like a really I think it was a podcast I listened to in 21 where he said where Sweeney said Clawson was the most underrated coach in the ACC. Just what is that respect between those two and how have these battles sort of grown into something that's been something for fans to watch uh, recently? Yeah, we, I was talking uh, talking about it uh, yesterday. In fact, at uh, at ACC basketball media tip off, that the mutual respect comes. I, I think they are similar people. They are, and I, I don't want to use the air quotes. Old school, do things the right way, coaches. Mm -hmm. and, and where Dabo gets in trouble because he doesn't exploit the transfer portal, as, as Coach Clawson said, he'll get his guys and develop them and stick with them, and. Most of the guys stay there, right? Right. Same thing at Wake. Wake has not lost a ton of people. They've lost more the last year or two. Um, but that's more a function of, of, you know, resources, as they say. And we spell the – instead of the S's, we have dollar signs in that, right? Oh, I like um, that. I like that a lot. <laughs> so clever. I, I, think, I think they agree on a lot of things, you know, big picture things on – what their their job as a coach is as a teacher, which is the bottom line for me. The, the best coaches are best teachers, and their jobs are to develop are to develop young men first and foremost. And obviously, they don't stay where they are without winning some football games. But it, it's part of a developmental process, and I think they are on the same page there for the most part. This Wake Forest. Uh program to me you can almost say that they are responsible for Dabo Sweeney being the head coach because the last time Clemson uh, lost to Wake Forest was you know up in Winston-Salem it was Tommy Bowden's last game Tommy Bowden after the game seemed a little bit down what's wrong I think I'm not going to be the head coach Monday when this thing rolls around and he wasn't they replaced him with some cat named Dabo and uh, this Dabo guy is 15-0 and against Wake Forest and, and that number absolutely blows me away because Wake has had some really good teams. Clemson's had some really good teams. They've been on a great roll. They've maybe had some teams that maybe weren't as good as Wake. Maybe a couple of years ago when Wake won the, you know, the ACC Atlantic played in the championship game. You know, that was a team that I thought could have come into Clemson and, and, and won, and yet they haven't been able to get over the hump. I could sense frustration from Sam Hartman. And, and you think at some point, no matter how good they are, somebody's going to beat somebody. Does this streak surprise you at all? A little bit, I think. And you may have heard it in Dave Clawson's pre press conference on Tuesday. He said the game the game two two years ago, he will take to his grave with him. That, <laughs> that double overtime game. And that was that was one, I think, uh, anyone associated with Wake, with Wake Forest will tell you they think they let that get away from them. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I don't disagree with that assessment. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at look at Clemson's basketball losing streak in Chapel Hill that finally came to an end. And 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 I, you know, same thing. Clemson basketball was good enough to win games. They just they just couldn't. It's not the same players every year. That's the other thing we we have to remember. And you know, Clemson recruits at a different level than Wake does. That's just reality. Um, but every once in a while, they do. They'll have a team that's – it has to be a year where Wake is up and Clemson's down. Doesn't happen very often, but that'll be that'll be the time that it happens. You know, in order for Wake to win on, on Saturday, you know, they'll have to play their very best, and Clemson will probably not have to be at their best. So, you, you know, they'll have to 
win the turnover battle, make some big plays, don't let big, you know, all the all the things the coaches will tell you. I think that uh the final comment there answered my last question. Uh David, if you have anything, I think we got a pretty solid preview here. No, I think this is great. Dave, we appreciate you coming on and uh, we will see you in the press box. We're, we're taking out of here early in the morning and uh, we plan on being there about nine. You'll probably be uh, more wide awake than me. Cause I, uh, I actually signed up to do a handful of high school games on the local TV package, which is fun uh, to see the high school kids out there. And, and when they see the bright lights, so I'll, I have the game in uh, neighboring County tonight, which means I won't get, normally I would go to bed about nine 30 tonight for a noon game, but uh going to be a couple hours after that so uh you might have to point me in the right direction when you see me in the press box tomorrow <laughs> we'll make sure we do when we see you dave and this was dave gorn wake forest sideline reporter a man of many hats as we said earlier in the podcast as you've seen in the banners flashed below I want to thank our sponsors for uh all they do to make this orange crush podcast possible dave thank you for your time guys thank you if you're traveling to winston-salem be safe have a great day and take care